Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me on this episode of 404 Logic Not Found, where we break down a series of epic fails, stupid moves, hot takes, and generally illogical happenings in the world of cryptocurrency. If you like crypto, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification button. And if you have a suggestion for future episodes of 404 Logic Not Found, please do comment the story below for a chance to get shouted out as a contributor on the next story. You can also DM me on Twitter at Hashoshi4. Now, the first calamity of logiclessness is one that I almost cannot believe is real. It was discovered recently that the CFO or Chief Financial Officer of a Decentralized Autonomous Organization or DAO behind two popular DeFi protocols in the Avalanche ecosystem, Wonderland and Abracadabra, was actually a fairly notorious bad actor. Now, this requires a little bit of backstory to really understand, so here goes. Back in 2018, a crypto exchange in Canada called Quadriga CX effectively lost hundreds of millions of dollars worth of user funds due to the sudden and mysterious death of one of its founders. And it was later discovered that Quadriga was running a pretty sketchy business that ended up costing users even more than $145 million in the end. The official story from Quadriga CX in terms of the lost funds is that the co-founder's sudden death rendered the funds unrecoverable as the deceased held the keys to access the funds. Moral of the story, Quadriga was a disaster rife with mystery and suspicious activity and suspected fraud. Fast forward to 2022 and you have this conglomerate of DeFi protocols on Avalanche run by a leader, Daniel or Daniele Sestigali, my apologies if I butcher the name, and an anonymous treasury manager under the moniker 0x Sifu, among other people. Then suddenly, the identity of 0xSifu is revealed to be a man by the name of Michael Patron, who just so happens to be the co-founder of Quadriga CX. And that was a moment of shock for many, including myself. Based on what I've been able to find online, it's reported that Michael Patron has been involved in several instances of fraudulent or scammy behavior, including a reported conviction in the United States related to identity fraud and instances of credit card fraud. In short, this is probably not the type of person you want anywhere near a treasury of user funds. I digress. Of course, in the wake of this news, Sestigali called for a community vote to remove Michael Patron from his post altogether. However, this begs the question, how did Sestigali bring this person into the fold in the first place? Because after this revelation of 0x Sifu's identity, Sestigali disclosed that he had discovered Michael Patron was Sifu at least one month prior to the public getting this knowledge, stating, I quote, I want everyone to know that I was aware of this and decided that the past of an individual doesn't determine their future. Now, I'll make clear that I respect this sentiment. People do deserve second chances. But in this case, this seems to be a pattern of behavior that cannot be let pass. In the end, at the time of recording, it seems Wonderland is no more. It will be dissolved, refunding users that are left, at least unless an alternative proposal is approved to change course. However, the fact remains that this is one of the most bizarre sagas I've ever seen in crypto in all of my years. Not only does this hurt investors that participated in this protocol not knowing the identity of 0 Sifu, but it also points to a huge question. How do you balance the crypto space's pseudonymity with the need to do due diligence on someone for a role in an organization, particularly one that requires a lot of trust? And furthermore, why did Sestigali not immediately throw the flag and alert the community to this concern when it came to his attention? This is all rhetorical, of course. There's no real answer. But the point here is that Sestigali could have potentially saved this project from dissolution and tumult if he had just taken action, even simply to alert the community to the past actions of Zero X Sifu, otherwise known as Michael Patron. This is an unenviable position to be in, having to choose between dropping the dime on someone and then not creating an issue where there isn't one. Zero X Sifu, aka Michael Patron, hadn't done anything wrong, at least that we know of, or not yet, in the context of Wonderland, but is that enough to say that the past is the past? Is it enough to say that nothing has happened, therefore nothing will? It's quite the conundrum. But still, to me, it is a 404 logic not found to choose to act in solidarity with someone who has a not-so-savory past, particularly in a role that involves a ton of trust. So I feel for Sestigali here, but this was not the right choice, at least in my opinion. But you tell me, what do you think? Leave a comment below. 
Now, the second absence of logic is focused squarely on a very common pattern that I'm starting to see in the mainstream product market around NFTs, which is the latest hype on the block, pun intended. With the billions being spent in the NFT space, you're starting to see all kinds of businesses, new and old, starting to dip their toes in the water, and that's not a surprise. However, many of these are simply making NFTs for the sake of making NFTs, for easy money or for publicity or for both. And the problem is, both the NFT faithful in the crypto space and the growing volume of NFT haters around the world are not taking kindly to low effort NFT launches by their favorite brands and companies. And frankly, many people are angry in general that companies are releasing NFTs in the first place for a myriad of reasons. Stigma around NFTs being worthless and terrible for the environment just being a couple examples. Those are two things for another episode, so I'm just going to leave those be for now. That could be a whole other show. The fact of the matter is, you only get one shot at an NFT-related project or launch. And if your launch is deemed to be a cash grab or low effort without much utility or value, the communities on both sides of the fence, the NFT lovers and haters, will remember that for a long time. And this means that even the biggest companies with the most established brands and the most trust need to be very careful about how they go about this type of project, making sure it's well thought out, valuable to the end consumer, and that whatever that product is, needs to have a roadmap for long-term utility and value to the end customer. For example, instead of releasing expensive pieces of digital art for one-time purchase and no potential resale value or experience attached to them, brands should be thinking about ways to bring digital content and digital assets in a way that's interwoven into the way their brand interacts with customers and fans in the long term. This is the key to success. However, these types of examples are few and far between, and the status quo is low effort NFTs focused on quick cash and brand awareness. And this is completely counterproductive because what it does is it shows the complete lack of understanding of what the general NFT purchasing population is really looking for in an NFT, particularly when it, it's expensive. And I would implore brands to think about NFTs and products that involve them as they would any other product that they launch. You have to think about the long term and what value it brings to customers, what experience and joy it might bring to a customer. Otherwise, you're at cruising altitude in the 404 logic not found territory. So this is a huge opportunity for game companies and brands and other companies to build products and communities that are squarely and natively digital in nature. Hence the focus on the metaverse in recent months. And this is the time where winners and losers are going to be decided. This is where long-term winners are setting up for success by building stable, well-designed platforms on which to build upon in years to come. Building experiences. Let me ask you this. Let me know in the comments. What would make an NFT valuable to you from one of your favorite brands or companies? Imagine what that would be for you. What are your favorite use cases outside of digital art? Would love to hear from you. Now, it's time for a quick logic break because only covering illogical stuff, negative stuff without acknowledging positives can be a bit of a drag. So here's a great example of a company who is actively working to avoid the pitfalls I just described in NFT adoption. And this company is the sponsor of my childhood, Nintendo. And I don't mean they're literally the sponsor of my childhood, but I spent an incredible amount of time playing Nintendo games and consoles as a kid, and I am better for it. That is true. Anyways, I digress. Nintendo is approaching NFTs in the healthiest way possible, at least in my view, focusing on the end user and the customer rather than their bottom line. With various gaming companies landing on the completely opposite ends of the spectrum from you know, Ubisoft diving headfirst into NFTs, and then you have other game companies ravaging the idea of NFTs and bashing it on social media, they're really just polar opposites. There's very little in between. But Nintendo seems to be striking a healthy balance, recently stating in an interview that in thinking about NFTs for Nintendo's product line, the focus is, I quote, what joy can we provide to our players? And that's ultimately the key. Can you provide utility and value to your users without eroding the absolutely unquestionable priority of any gaming company that should remain in first place making fun games? Games are key, making good games. NFTs are a means to an end, but not the end itself. They might not even fit into all games, let's be real. But Nintendo is teaching a lesson in leadership here by focusing on that fact and prioritizing what's most important and not making a move for profit now that can completely erode the benefits of NFTs to their users, and more importantly, not eroding the quality of their games. 
Now, I want to thank the sponsor of today's show, OVR, a mobile-first augmented reality metaverse platform that allows you to own hexagonal plots of land around the world to build virtual experiences atop. OVR's mobile app lets you create a custom avatar to deploy in the virtual world and interact with digital content built on various creators' hexagonal plots of land, also known as Overland. Of course, both the land and user-created content can be owned as NFTs, which are now available on Polygon as a means to cut down on the rampant gas fees on Ethereum. Furthermore, there will be an opportunity for users in the OVR ecosystem to earn by contributing to the platform in the form of map to earn or M2E, effectively letting users earn rewards for contributing to the high fidelity mapping that OVR requires to deliver the rich map-based experiences that it will provide. So to learn more about OVR, check out the links in the description and pinned comment. And remember, this nor any episode of this show is in any way a call to action to buy tokens of any kind. So please be safe in the crypto markets. Well, thank you for watching this episode of 404 Logic Not Found. This series is an intermittent series, so you'll have to get subscribed and hit the notification bell to know when this episode is going to drop next. If you have some time to stick around, please check out this week's episode of Crypto Over Coffee, my weekly crypto and tech news show. It's full of relevant insights and information that helps you navigate the muddy waters of cryptocurrency in a hype-free way. So have a great rest of your week, and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.